So I'm going to ask a question. Um, whoever wants to answer it can, if multiple people want, but you don't all have to answer this one. So in my mind, I've thought about this a bunch, and I think that the number one issue with climate change is that people somehow are not clear on time frames. I saw a thing recently, um, I guess the IPCC released some report recently, and CNN had big headlines that due to climate change, the economy was going to shrink by 10% by 2100. And I was you know, laughing how ridiculous nobody, nobody could care less if in 81 years the economy shrinks by 10%. It's beyond farcical. No one cares. So the second anyone talks about climate change and then says, and if we don't do this by 2100, people are celebrating. Oh, they got 80 more years. When Guy McPherson says, we're all going to be extinct in seven, then suddenly you're saying, what? What'd you say? So the question really that most people are saying is, I got a nice big TV. I got a heated and air-conditioned house. How long can I keep this going? So the real question is, when? When do we get to the point that the storms and the lack of food and the disruptions are just so disruptive to a civilized society that people would care a lot? Are we a year away, five years away, 10 years away, 20, 40? How far away? And not about islands that are flooding far away. In New York, in Long Island, in this, the people in this room in Long Island, how far away are we from real disruptions? And I don't mean just a few almonds not being on the shelf. How far away are we from real disruptions where the electricity might be out for six months, where we are really disrupted and they, you know, they, they can't fill up the gas stations with gas anymore because the trucks can't get there and there's not food for everyone? When, what, what time frame in your mind, even though there's no real answer, when do you, how long do you think we have? When is the question. I, I think it's the wrong question. <laughs> You're going to have to wait a while, and by that time it's way too late. You, you can't wait until that occurs before we completely transform our energy system because of the lag in the system. We're already at a point which is extremely dangerous for young people and future generations. So it, it, we have all the knowledge that we need to know that this is the true story. <laughs> you know, it's not, we're not, it's not a, uh, a hoax. I mean, there may be one person in Washington who thinks that, but th we know that that's not true. And so I, I mean, we're not going <laughs> to, I don't think we're going to wait until that happens. But uh, so I just, I mean, if, if uh, we can see things are beginning to happen now on the kind of things that you want to see, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, the real threat is the, just the fact that we're building into the climate system uh, changes at, which cannot be prevented. You know, to, just to stabilize things at where they are now, you have to restore the planet's energy balance. The planet is substantially out of energy balance, and you've got to change the composition a lot. In fact, with some of the best scientists, relevant scientists in the world, we wrote a paper that said, oh, to rebalance, you've got to go back to 350 parts per million. Well, that's pretty damn tough. Uh, IPCC is now talking about, oh, well, if we want to keep it one and a half degrees, then we've got to start sucking CO2 out of the air at a phenomenal rate with no, with no way that we can figure out how to do that in reality. So we're already at the point of <laughs> extreme danger. We don't have to wait until you get those things mm -hmm. that you're hoping for or right. thinking about. And I think just to, you know, to add to that, you know, we are headed for a warmer world. You can't stop that. I mean, we are going to be, we're already in a warmer world, and uh, there's heat in the pipeline, as Jim has written about in a number of papers, but the real challenge is getting a handle on the problem before it gets out of hand. We can live with some warming, 
But if we wait too long, then it gets out of hand and then these cataclysmic events that you mention uh, could well arise. But uh, I have growing optimism because I think we're starting to turn the corner on this. It's in fits and starts, absolutely. Uh, our current administration is not helping, uh, but I am optimistic. Yeah, uh, a report crossed my desk maybe a dozen or so years ago about what climate change could mean for New York City. And they talked about um, the, the fact that storm surge is likely to increase and flooding will increase. You could envision New York City subways flooding and then Superstorm Sandy hit New York City and everything that played out read very similar to that report that the scientists had put together and said these events are more likely to happen. So those of us in the field who are looking and saying, you know, where's climate change going to hit first? 20 years ago, we would say, well, it's those low-lying small island states. You know, they could be completely inundated with just a matter of feet of sea level rise. But then we had in the United States, uh, Hurricane Katrina. And we had over 100,000, 200,000 people having to evacuate, many of which never went back. And we never would have believed that the first large scale flow of climate related refugees would be in our country, our rich developed country. Sure, we caused the problem, but it wasn't going to hit us. But it is, and I think it's each of these wake up calls that's getting scientists saying, okay, it's becoming clear, these are the kind of events we're seeing, yet it's like when you get the wake-up call and you hit the snooze alarm and you kind of forget after the disaster and politicians are very reluctant to say, well, now's not the time to talk about climate change, let's, let's get the infrastructure back and, oh, but, but when will it be time to talk about climate change? So I, I think we don't have to wait five or ten years. The science is in on what's likely to happen, when or where these events will happen, nobody knows the order or the time frame, but I think we're seeing enough already that's disturbing and should make um, thoughtful people want to take action. But j just to clarify that question, um, I assume that we will change, but if we didn't, if we stayed on the exact course we are with a little bit of an increase in solar and but nothing crazy, and, if we just stayed on the course we are, continue to admitting, or even if we got better, if other countries started eating meat and polluting like crazy, what kind of time frames do you feel are we looking at? Are we saying that, you know, are we talking about we have five years, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? I assume we're going to make great decisions and turn this around. But if we didn't, you know, what, what is your, in your mindset is the time frame before someone living in Long Island in New York you know, they, they was so, we had all these cataclysmic things to the point that you know, normal life was completely not possible. No, I, I can't, it's hard to pin a number on that because there's way too many unknowns out there. But if I were to throw a number out there for debate, I'd say 50 years. Just throwing out a number. I'm, I'm still fixated on, I think you're asking a, a strange question, Steve, to be honest. You know, like, why wasn't Superstorm Sandy enough for New Yorkers? You didn't have months without power, but you had days and weeks in which Wall Street was flooded and the greatest city on earth was shut down and people died and maybe it wasn't Huntington, Long Island, but it was the Rockaways that were underwater. And, you know, we're a boiling frog as a species, unable to see the problem we've got. But I would argue your threshold was passed some time ago for many hundreds and millions of people, uh, hundreds of millions of people. You know, that we are killing millions annually. We are li literally from climate-born vector diseases, from extreme weather events. We're making morbidity rise. We're making refugees and internally displaced populations rise. Humanity's already crossed that threshold. I think maybe you're trying to ask about when does runaway greenhouse effect kick in and all of the positive feedback loops which Jim and others here have studied for decades, when do they become untenable or un unable to be pulled back? Probably within 50 years. You know, again, it's sort of a mental attitude thing. Why are humans so stupid that we don't act in our own self-interest? 
and particularly this nation. I would argue most other nations on earth where you do not have pretenders. Remember, we had all of the nations of significance on earth sign the Paris Agreement just four years ago and say, we need to do this. We had the G7 commit to get off fossils by 2070, I think, under Obama, the previous leader of this nation. We got one dude in the White House and now we're back to talking about whether it's real or not. Everyone else knows it's real and is trying to get off. You know, the Chinese, the Indians, the big population nations, are they doing enough? No, but are they at least turned the corner and decided to do it? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are because they're rational and they know their self-interest. The United States has a unique ability, it fe I feel, to, to work against its own self-interest. And by which I mean the economic self-interest. We pioneered all the technologies we sit here on this table talking about. Photovoltaics invented down the road in New Jersey. Lithium-ion batteries in Austin, Texas. You, you name it. We, we championed the change and then we let it go and become the boon of some other culture and economy. That's our choice. But, you know, New York's already crossed that threshold a decade ago. Well, I'd like to repeat, we're in an Earth emergency. It's a climate system emergency. We are in the sixth mass extinction. Richard Leakey um, wrote the classical book 10 years ago. Um, uh, the uh, experts at Stanford um, published uh, two, three years ago that we were in the sixth mass extinction and we've been in it for a long time. And the title of the paper, the title of the peer-reviewed paper was um, Biological Annihilation Due to Loss of Vertebrate Species. There was a pub paper published just a year ago that used the same term, annihilation. And uh, these are extraordinary things to read and words for scientists to um, publish. So I agree with the United Nations um, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who um, made several very powerful statements um, uh, last year. And he made them in the, in the hope and the expectation that the uh, United Nations Climate Conference, which uh, occurred in Poland last month, would really come up with some real progress and that nations would firmly agree and firmly commit to put global emissions into decline because global emissions are still increasing. Last year, emissions of carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels increased by a whopping 2.7%. And um, we can't assume that we have a future. You know, 10 years, 20 years, it's all meaningless. We can't assume we have a future now. And um, uh, to go back to the Secretary General, he said that climate change, he said, I have lots of big problems come through my desk, but there's one that's way bigger than all of them put together, and that's climate change. And he said climate change is, and obviously he was advised by experts, he said that climate change is quite simply an existential threat to most life on the planet, and particularly to humanity. That, that's no small statement. Um, that is a momentous statement for a world leader to make. Unfortunately, it wasn't picked up by the media, but his later statements that he made, he made this one in May, his other statements from the United Nations that he made in September of last year, they were picked up. And quite correctly, he said that according to the science, we have until 2020 to put our emissions into reverse. Um, putting emissions into reverse, by the way, which was a phrase which was used by the IPCC assessment in 2007, over 10 years ago. And um, uh, we're still increasing. Fossil fuel emissions are still increasing. Um, the uh, Secretary General said that uh, if we don't put emissions into decline rapidly, like now, then he said, and again, he was clearly advised by the experts, that we risk missing the ultimate boat, that we risk missing the time when we can prevent runaway climate change. 
Now, runaway climate change is a lay term. It's not actually a scientific term. But um, uh, what it means, and uh, Dr. Hansen has been talking about this for years and years and years, is that there is a massive amount of inertia in the climate system. And um, uh, the, there's, there's more than a massive amount of emotion in the climate system now because as everybody understands atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is what matters. Atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is supposed to be at 350 parts per million or below so that we have energy balance in the biosphere. It's now over 410 parts per million. It's rocketing up. It is increasing atmospheric CO2 which, can, which causes most of the ocean heating, most of the surface warming, and all of the ocean acidification, it's increasing, according to the World Meteorological Office, at a rate which is 100 times faster than natural CO2 increase, which gets us out of an ice age and into a warm period. And it's worse than that, because the WMO stated that According to all the science that we have, all the proxies that we have that go back 50 million years now, that atmospheric carbon dioxide has never increased this fast. We, all of humanity and all of life are in one hell of a fix. And as we've heard, it's not difficult to put it right. Um, our politicians, our leaders, are giving our tax money to fossil fuel corporations to burn up our future. They're actually burning up our food because we have to have a stable climate, obviously, to uh, have agriculture working for us. So uh, I don't believe we've any time left at all. I believe we had no time left years ago.